Hey guys, I'm here to talk to you today about a nonfiction biography that no one may care about but me, but I had enough interesting thoughts about it that I wanted to share them with you guys and you know, maybe maybe somebody somebody besides me will care. And the book in question is the biography by Robert K. Massey of Catherine the Great, titled Catherine the Great, Portrait of a Woman. From what I could tell from my research, it is oft considered the definitive biography on Catherine the Great. And it's a huge book, it's 625 pages. I listened to it on audio, uh, so I didn't get that sense of like a huge chunky book, but it was definitely a long slog to get through. I think I had to re um, rent that book from the Boston Public Library like three or four times um, just to make it all the way. And those are like two week rental so it took me a while started it back in last year just finished it now uh, but it was it was worth it it was a long read full of a lot of information and at the end of it I can definitely tell why people call it the definitive biography one of the first things that I liked is that it takes till about halfway or so to even get to the time when Catherine was on the throne it actually takes the time to look at Catherine when she was Sophie, when she wasn't, you know, a Russian empress, when she was a little German princess um, thrust into a situation that, you know, somehow she made her own, even if that was never what she thought would happen with her life. And it put Catherine the person in so much more of a better perspective to see her family, the way that she grew up, the way that she was kind of boxed into being Peter's wife, um, you know, the, the future czar that she would later, you know, overthrow. And also how she got there. Um, I was really hazy myself on reasons why this little German princess, basically kind of nobody would be chosen. Um, and also why her husband Peter was chosen because he was not actually Russian either. He was also German. Um, and so it was really interesting to actually have all the political machinations behind how these two players got to the Russian throne to begin with and how their characters were shaped as kids. It spent ample time describing their relationship and not just the particulars of their relationship, you know, physically, um, but also psychologically, how each of them grew to be, like Peter grew to be the despotic monarch that everybody hated, and how Catherine really came into being the astute empress that she was, and how how committed she was to that from the beginning, which I also was really interested in seeing. Um, so again, up until the halfway point, it's still, she's not empress. Her husband isn't even emperor. So I really love that, that ample time being given to that. If Catherine the Great's rise to power is something that you're interested in, like hands down, automatically I would hand this off to you to read because that's where I really found the most interesting things. All of these small details and facts that I didn't know, small events from her life that don't sound all of that interesting um, when you think about them in, you know, as themselves events, but fit into the larger context a lot better. I also had no idea, and again, like I'm not a huge Catherine the Great scholar or anything, just like cursory, cursory interest for me which is why I wanted to read the biography, um, but I had no idea that things like Catherine and Peter never slept together because he didn't like her for some reason, though he seems to have had a mistress later on and like all of these, not all of these, but she was literally thrust upon another guy so that she could get pregnant and continue the, the lineage and, and the monarchy which was really crazy and how open that whole thing was with like her having a lover and her husband having a lover and that being like totally, totally kind of fine. Uh, that was really interesting. But the topic of Catherine's love life is also where the book started to be of issue to me. And so you get 
the part before she is Empress of Russia, great. The part describing how she becomes, you know, Peter's wife as he is emperor and then comes to realize, oh my god, Peter can't be emperor of Russia. Like, he's a terrible czar. We need to get rid of him. Um, everyone hates him. And the, the way that he could have driven Russia into the ground, like, you get that very, very passionately and well described. But then you come to the point where Catherine is finally on the throne. She is empress of Russia. She is everything and, and the real reign of Catherine the Great is about to start and I guess given the detail and the stuff from the previous portion of the book I expected a very interesting political discussion of having like a female monarch on the throne of these things that she went through of the great achievements of her reign and while you got some of them so much of the end part of the book was devoted to describing her various reign of lovers. And while I understand that players like Gregory Potemkin, very important to her reign on a political level, on a personal level, very important, like, the idea that most of the book describing her reign is framed through what lover she had at the time, <sighs> It was real weird to me, and I understand that things like the Orloff brothers and Grigory Orloff, who was the soldier lover that she had, whose family really helped her overthrow Peter, I understand that's entwined politically. I understand Potemkin is involved politically with this too, but like, there was so much time spent describing her relationships with guys that I didn't really care about. like. Okay, yes, Stanislav Poniatowski, she goes on to make him king of Poland and her puppet king in Poland. Again, important to have brought up, but like this constant listing of her lovers and defining what period of her life happened when by the lover, it was so weird and so unnecessary in a lot of ways. And there's just like a few chapters in the beginning of this that focus on Catherine as Catherine and her political machinations and all this stuff that she believed in and like her enlightenment policies. Huge chunk on her love life and all about that. There are a couple chapters actually like more about Potemkin in a way than they are about Catherine. And then you have the end of her life where it goes back to being a little bit more about her philosophies and her overall lasting legacy. But it was just, why guys? Why we gotta do that? Um, so I didn't like that so much. But again, if you like Catherine the Great, if you wanna know about Catherine the Great's life, you wanna know a lot of tiny details about her life and really rich you know, texture and detail, this is definitely a book that you should pick up. Again, I may be the only person in the world to care about this, but like I said, there's, there's an interesting thing for me for having Catherine the Great, a portrait of a woman, be entirely back-ended by a discussion of her lovers and the books written by a dude. I don't know. Maybe that's just a coincidence. Maybe I'm reading into that too much, but I wasn't a huge fan of that. Um, even if some of them were important. But now I do feel like even though I didn't get as much detail from the length of her reign as I really wanted, I have a much better understanding of the kind of person that Catherine the Great was, which was really the point of the whole thing to begin with. So, I'm gonna stop talking, because um, I could go on about this for a while. But yeah, if you have happened to read this book, uh, do let me know. I may just be talking to dead air. I will try and do more reviews in the future that are not weird nonfiction, or at least interesting nonfiction. But um, this is what I have for you this week. So look forward to next week when maybe I'm back to reading something interesting. Uh, bye, guys.